All right, my apologies first for the change in the program as well as my attire. Greetings from Boston. I'm in a hockey tournament with my son, so here I am. But I'm glad we could make it. And I've been hearing the talks on the phone. Unbelievable, amazing stuff. And I'm sorry, all I got to share with you is what, what almost appears to be mundane, an anterior oblique approach. Who even does that anymore? But, but Rick Hines, I think, did an amazing presentation. And I agree with that case. I would deal with it exactly the same way. In fact, we just did one last week. So Rick, thank you. You made my life very easy. Let me share my screen, if I may. And um, hopefully you can see this. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, let me get out of here. All right, good. So my task was to talk about anterior service, why I go there. I don't like acronyms. Basically, I'm going to say it a million times. This is an approach. That's all it is, an approach. So I'm going to keep saying that forever. These are my disclosures. Let me go to the screen. There you go. Okay. Why did I change? It's very simple. Lumbar plexopathy. I'm glad at last we're actually talking about it. Uh, Ten years ago, this was taboo. You could not talk about it, and people refused to accept it. It was a fascinating world we lived in. Luckily now, today, everyone talks about it. We know it's a fact. There's been paper after paper publishing problems with it. Yes, it's small, but wait till you get a quarter of palsy. It won't be small anymore. And I'll walk you through this. There's a lot of papers that have talked about it. The incidence is anywhere between 2 to 5%. I'm talking of quarter of palsy and nothing else. The little twitch, uh, little twitch, tingling, numbness, paresthesias, we're not even counting that. We're talking a full-blown quarter of palsy. And you'll see a lot of papers on it. I'm not going to be little. Here's a great paper if you want to read it. Uh, literally after 18 months, there was still a 2.3% motor and 9.6 sensory deficit. And that's only with 25% being followed, by the way. There's one URB slide. We all see this. We talk about this nerve. But actually, it's not this nerve. I'm going to direct your attention to a great paper by Steve Ludwig, and I've always quoted this. It's a massive plexus of perforating branches that exist throughout the muscle. It's not one nerve we're missing here. So when you go down, you literally plaster this plexus down, and it's unbelievable how lucky we've been in not getting more of a problem with this. And I'll ask anyone who's interested in the subject, read this paper. It's a significant plexus of perforating branches everywhere. There's a genital femoral nerve sitting on top on the anterior third. Again, it's amazing how we don't go through this. Uh, so for me, it was personal. A uh, very close patient of mine, I knew very well, full-blown quadriceps palsy in my 213th case. Uh, luckily, she recovered over nine months, but that was it. I don't want to ever see this ever again. It changed for me. We started going in front of the service like we did for years with open thoracoabdominal approaches. What is it? It's a space, accessing the space between the service and the blood vessels. I always go left. Uh, it's a safer zone with the aorta there. You want to be on the aortic side and not on the IVC side. Basically accessing corridors that exist. And to me, that's the essence of MI surgery. Don't move things around, get in the corridor. We do that at ACDF every day. We know the carotid, we don't go dissect it, we feel it, move the trachea and esophagus, find our plane down and do an ACDF. This is very similar. It's literally an ACDF of the lumbar spine where you find your plane between the stoves and the big blood vessels. And if you study the MRI, it really becomes the key. So just like Rick said, it, it enables us today to do all lumbar levels, one position, and access every interbody as needed, uh, whether it be 5-1 or whether it be 1-2, whether it be revision. Studying the MRI is critical. I'm going to walk you through this. It really makes a big difference how we approach it. Now, in this case, the 3-4 clearly is a plane between the aorta and the stoves and you can go pre -sows. As you go down to four, five, I call your attention to the IVC is already split. It's starting to come in the plane. This would be a really bloody Sunday if someone tried a lateral approach. The IVC is sitting right there. So this to me is going in the bifurcation, even at four, five. One step forward, if you study this, you'll see the iliac crest is high. You actually have a hard time doing the lateral. We don't even look at the iliac crest anymore. 
To me, the bifurcation is the anatomical determination of your segmentation. If it's already bifurcated at four five, it is behaving as a five one, and we would go between the bifurcation. If it's not bifurcated, it can continue and stay lateral. Like if I five one again, we go in the bifurcation. So the MRI tells us: Are we going lateral to the aorta, or are we going in the bifurcation? Here's another patient at five one where I have room lateral to the aorta pre service. So we study the MRI, and this patient, by the way, that five one, your iliac crest will be out of the way. Have a look at it, see it, see it for yourself. The bifurcation is a very good anatomical landmark of your entire anatomy, but that's how it's framed. That's how we are developed. And um, so we don't even look at the x-rays anymore. Uh, today, if, if it's in the bifurcation, this patient got a two level in the bifurcation lateral and three, four was a lateral, as we call it, pre source So that's all that the determination is. Same position, all oblique. Are we going in the bifurcation or not? And that determines that how we go. So here's just a video showing four, five, three, four, and two, three, which had all access to one approach, one inch incision. You undermine the skin up and down a little bit. A lot of it's finger dissection. I'm gonna speed up the video a little bit. So if you go, it's all finger there. As you get down, once the bobby's over, use your finger, split the external oblique. There's the external oblique that's split. You then find the internal oblique and you split the internal oblique. Once you've split that, you go to the transfer salus at this point, and you're seeing the internal oblique, split the internal oblique, get to the transfer salus, finger goes in, sweep the retroperitoneum. And we've all seen that. Just like Rick said, sweep everything off the psoas and take it anterior. You can feel the displacement in many a patient. Swing their finger around. Now my finger is literally swung all the way around on the anterior structures. The aorta is behind me. I can feel the pulsation. Hold it there. I bring a, bring a small retractor, put it right over my finger, and I'm in the anterior sore space. That retractor stays there, keeps the peritoneum and the vessels anteriorly. The next retractor goes over the sores. We do not retract the sores whatsoever. I want to see it. It actually goes over the sores. So I, now I'm looking at the anterior space. I'm going to show you in a minute. You'll get retroperitoneal flat that comes in. Use a sponge stick to sweep that away. You'll get into its space there. That, that, that works really well in sweeping fat away in front of the service. The other two we find very useful is an endoscopic peanut. It really is delicate, sweeps the anterior area really well, whatever fat you have. You're looking on the direct vision now where you are. Bring your first probe, drop it in, put your wire in, take an x-ray and you're sort of ready to go as to where you are. And now the x-ray comes in, see your mark exactly Rick said. Now I know where I am. Now start dilating. Everything's under direct vision. I'm looking at everything. There's a sympathetic chain moving away. Everything is swept. There's not a one, you can see the genital femoral no, by the way, on the so it's right here. So everything's under vision through that incision. You put your retractors down. It's really comforting the surgeon to know you are actually looking at what you're doing and not just relying on some beeps and whistles. The retractor goes down, you get to where you need to go. Every retractor comes out now, your tube becomes a retractor and essentially you're now ready to go in terms of what you need to do. So the next step would be identifying the disk space. I leave the wire in place. Like Rick said, always see the ALL. This retractor is really useful. Shows me the ALL where I am. I'm now ready, looking at my disk space clearly. You can see the cells, front of the cells, do your annulotomy at this point. And after this, it literally is a lateral discectomy, as we've talked about again and again. So my annulotomy is done. I can see it again in a direct vision. Cops come in, bronzos come in. I'm not going to bore you without doing a discectomy. The only, the only thing, if any, is that orthogonal maneuver. If I can go back on this, I'll just show you that orthogonal maneuver which we, we do see very clearly when we do it. Here's my carb going in. Now the carb as it goes in is obviously going in oblique as you can see it. On x-ray, I'm looking at the sagittal orientation with one shot to know if I'm going cordially or distally to maintain, that's all that is, to know where the orientation is. To me, it's critical you preserve the end plate. I'll keep talking about it more and more. That's the orthogonal maneuver. The carb is in the disc. 
I can see the ALL. The key is don't go orthogonally before you're in the disc or you're going to slip. The ALL protects me. I'm orthogonal now. And the rest of the procedure is basically every, every instrument going in goes that way. I'm looking at it, everything under direct vision. And so that's done. So all of five one. One of the greatest things I like about it, when I'm going in the bifurcation, I have a vascular surgeon doing my exposure to move the blood vessels. Not that we can do it. I'm very comfortable doing it. But there's a problem, I'd rather he be there. So I'm in the bifurcation. He's doing the exposure. We are really busy vascular surgeons. Literally can't get them. So for me, I give him a block time between anything from 7 to 9.30. He shows up. He does it. He shows up late. I do 4, 5, 3, 4, 2, 3. And five ones ready for him to go in the same position. So it's been really efficient. So again, the, the approach has helped me a lot in that sense. I'm not waiting for the guy to show up. So this is a five one exposure. You're going just lateral to the rectus sheet. You're popping, you see the rectal pit, the fat. You go in down there. Again, sweep everything. It's all finger, finger, finger. And there's one thing I think we learn to respect from the vascular surgeons is a lot of finger dissection. There are no sharp tools. There are no instruments. You're feeling things and moving it. And so, so once that's done, you really want to protect the ureter. It moves with the peritoneum. That is the ureter. It moves off and away. Next is really identifying the blood vessels and the blood vessels where the retractors go in. One goes in the left common iliac, which is the top retractor, the C14 centimeters. One's at the bifurcation and one's in the left common iliac at the bottom. It exposes your 5-1, there's the blood vessel. So you need a retractor there. That's 5-1 being exposed. If you work in the bifurcation, you're really moving nothing, but placing retractors in the bifurcation, if you planned it right, all you do is take a middle sacral artery. So it's as minimally invasive as you can ever get. Here's your 5-1 discectomy. Rest of it's all a regular A-lift discectomy. Now, you don't need fancy instruments. If you do 5-1, I just move on to 4, 5, 3, 4, 2, 3. This is how we just move up the spine. Again, Rick showed that. That to me is regular now. You can do a regular A-lift device with this approach at 5-1. We routinely do it today. You don't need a fancy device. It's the company's hit me for it. It's a regular ALIF. It's an ALIF in the lateral approach. That's all it is. You got your approach between the vessels. Disc is open. Do your discectomy. Put an ALIF in. I think people will recognize what this device is. It's just an ALIF that we've constantly done in a supine position that I'm comfortable doing in the same lateral position today. So uh, that's just, again, x rays of the same thing. If we go and access multiple levels, and then obviously do a percutaneous screws and get the corrections you need. So yes, everyone talks about anti cells Of course, there are complications with any procedure. But I caution you, there's a whole lot here. Half of the papers, actually three quarters of the papers, when you look at what they did, which I'm going to come to in a minute, every complication is out there. But that's what they're calling an oblique retroperitoneal approach. This is a thoracic abdominal approach to me. This is from the paper. And look at all the papers there. We literally are doing it through a, through a one inch incision and dropping it down, truly minimally invasive. And like I said, an ACDF of the lumbar spine, that's what. And it's done on a direct vision. I see a lot of people doing pre service but then just go right down with the retractor, blind like you're used to with trans service. I really don't see you having any advantage there. And you probably run into things like sympathetics, ureter or other problems. Uh, we published on this extensively. And the other thing I want to point out is lordosis. We've never had a problem getting lordosis. Place it anteriorly, you get great release. The other thing I liked hearing uh, just now was, I don't know why it's moving on its own. The other thing I liked hearing was, we don't need an ACR all the time. We've talked about it a lot. Yes, I agree. We rarely ever do an ACR in a virgin spine. In fact, never have. The only time we do an ACR is a fused patient with a 2-3 that's skyphotic or a 3-4 that's kyphotic where 4-1 to one is fused in lieu of a PSO to get salsal balance. We just did that last week. So we're getting really good lordosis time and time again. That's not been the issue in this approach. Complications again. I always quote this database, a Japanese database, national database, where they were just looking at laterals. They did not even look for, look out for trans-source anti -sewer. But happened to be, they found a large population of either and they started looking at it. And it's interesting. You can look at the service weakness significant between trans service and anti service. Of course, they had some peritoneal lacerations, 
or urethral injury when they went anti-service initially. But again, I think it really is the approach and how you master that approach to get there. But service and weakness and lumbar plexopathy is huge. I also like this, look at the learning curve. Institutions that did less than nine had the maximum complication weight. Whereas if you had done 100 or more, it really dropped down significantly your complication rate. So I think it's again, is a very good paper, both on learning curve experience, as well as comparing the two on a national database without any bias here. And we've had exactly the same thing. We changed our protocol and moved from trans-source to anti so pre so in 2011. And literally, Dr. Wood to this day never had any lumbar flexopathy and it's just not an issue because you're seeing it and you just don't go near the nerves. And I think it just makes natural sense. So I guess at the end of the day, no anatomical corridors, find them, access them. If it's in the bifurcation, we have a vascular surgeon to do that. If it's outside the bifurcation, I don't need an access surgeon. But it's all in the same approach, all lateral, every level access to go there. Thank you. Neil, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, um, do you want to talk about your case and we could go to questions? Just we're a sure. little behind. Done. I'll do that one second. Let me, I got to go to a new share, I guess. Uh, okay. I got to find this. Here. Give me one second. Go ahead and try it now, Dr. Non. Yeah, there you go. Got it. Okay, let me share it now. Oops. One second, guys. Ah, okay, share screen. Come on. You guys see it now? Yes. Yeah. All right. Let me go back to the large screen here. All right, so what I thought I'd do is two simple cases. Um, I, I may have shown this before, but it's a really good case to demonstrate what we talk about. Severe claudication, severe back pain, five years or more, failed everything, uh, appears on x-ray, possible two or three level disease, look more carefully, three level really, two, three, three, four, four, five, mainly three, four, and four, five. Look at the osteophytes at two, three. Here's the MRI, and you can see like collapsed discs. Um, Multi-level disease, if you will, at two, three, three, four, and four, five. Lateral position. Yes, you can do it any which way you want to do it, Severe stenosis here, we choose to do a lateral oblique approach to get to where we want to get to. Here's the MRI again. I think the important part is looking at that approach at every level. How can you get between the cells or get in the bifurcation? And you make that decision where we're approaching. Here's four, five. You can see here there is severe uh, stenosis, our lateral recess stenosis, if you will. Thick ligament, thick ligament, every level here, two, three, three, four, four, five. And um, so obviously numerous options, every one of them are perfect and wonderful. I'm not here to discuss what is better. Do what's most comfortable in your hands. We chose to do a three level uh, oblique lateral approach with percutaneous screws in the back. That's a montage of the x-rays. The key thing I show again and again is it's critical you see this elevation if you want indirect decompression. To that effect, you need to preserve the end plate. To that effect, it creates lordosis. So preservation of the end plate to me is everything in a lateral procedure. It not only will give you elevation, which will give you indirect decompression, it also will give you the lordosis you need. So I would say do anything and everything you can to know your end plate is preserved. Honestly, nothing else matters. Every other thing follows after. And you'll see it consistently if you repeat that you get really good indirect decompression and you get really good uh, uh, lordosis. As long as you place the implant device in the anterior third, again, positioning matters. So here's the post, post, what our, uh, the laterals, you can see the x-ray, you already got good lordosis at every single level. Not that this patient needed a lot. Here's the pre and post-op MRI. And initially we used to do MRIs for me to document for myself what was really happening. And of course the patients were staged to know that their claudicatory pain is gone. Here's again the pre-op and post-op MRI. And you can see how much that ligament stretches out. 
how much it stretches out between pre and post. And of course, patient's up and walking, does not have any claudicatory pain. You've documented indirect decompression. And today we don't even do the MRI. We just ask them how they're doing. And today it's a three level or, or a two or three level. I don't stage them anymore. I'm very comfortable doing uh, lateral indirect, like we talked about. And you can see that end plate preservation is so critical to see that motion, the movement, and then lock it up with screws in the back. So that's a simple case in terms of a simple, anyone's doing this, yes, start off with three, four, four, five, two, three, three, four. Those are the levels to really start off with any lateral case. They actually are much more simpler and allows you better access to these. Here's your three years out. She's actually three and a half, four years now. Now we'll jump a whole lot. Today, this is my complete workflow for what complex, complex scoliosis. It's really routine bread butter for us with the whole protocol we have. Severe adolescent idiopathic scoliosis from childhood, uh, idiopathic significant rotation, lived a good life, now significant symptomatic, 10 years, severe pain, back pain, medical history is there, and you see the magnitude of the curve, uh, significant thoracolumbar, scoliosis, truncal shift to the right, right thoracic, left lumbar, neurologically intact, had some paresthesias, 71 degree left lumbar curve, sorry, right thoracic with the left lumbar 55. The right thoracic curve is the major curve. And you're gonna be surprised at what I'm gonna tell you now. She's symptomatic in a lumbar spine. She's lived with a 71 degree curve all her life. She didn't come to me for the 71 degree curve. She came for the symptomatic lumbar spine. And so I want you to think about it and I would change our thinking dramatically. Now you measure the carbs, you obviously measure it. SV is what it is, PI and mismatch about 20. Here's a sagittal profile. She needs a little bit, not a lot. She actually is hypercompensating there. We have this comprehensive protocol we've done for years without a single osteotomy. There's not even a facet resection. You do not need releases. Um, and uh, this has been consistent for us for more than 15 years now. They all get laterals in single position. And then we get a walk, they move, get x-rays, reassess alignment, and go back. Here's our MRI. Uh, MRI showing each level there is. We plan our approach. We're going in the bifurcation or lateral to the aorta. Here's a CT scan to make sure no level is fused. You cannot do a lateral approach on a fused level where the facet's completely fused. If you've got osteophytic bridging, you could break it. But if the interbody is fused, that's going to be a nightmare of a day and not even worth it. Choose your other levels to work because you're achieving global balance and not segmental balance. And this patient just wants global balance and relief of pain. Pain's not coming from a fused level. Pain's coming from the unfused level where there is arthritis and facet degeneration. Always look at T-scores. Uh, it's all a routine protocol. She is osteoporotic significantly. We stop them on a PTH agonist right away, continue for a year. We do not wait any time. Once they got it, I operate, as long as they can keep it for the year. These are intra pictures. She was in the bifurcation four, five, and five, one, and we went lateral at the other levels, as you can see. An uh, oblique lateral approach gets that all in one day. Here's post stage one. And you can see we've got correction sagittally. That's not even an issue. But look coronally. You do not correct. Idiopathic rotation will not correct. We've got some coronal shift, not a lot, but you don't correct rotation. And we've got whole paper coming out now looking at that difference in the staging. But it's up, walking, no claudication, no radicular symptoms. And we get an x-ray to see where we are. And all I need now is literally to balance out the lumbar curve and that's so posterior. Did not touch the thoracic curve, but look how the thoracic curve unwound itself. That was a 70 degree right thoracic curve. It's down to literally 30 or 40. And it reorients itself as you balance the symptomatic lumbar spine out. So this is selective lumbar fusion and double major adult curves. And we've got many, many of these now, it's T12 to pelvis, lined up, balanced out. That's her immediate post-operative. She has a leg length discrepancy of one and a half centimeters. And that's what you're seeing right here. And you'll see in the next x-ray, six week follow-up, completely balanced out. Give her a shoe raise that she needs and that's it. She's asymptomatic, doing extremely well. The thoracic spine does not hurt in adults. It's very rare. And they have lived with that deformity all their life. Something I like a lot of people to think about. We cut the surgery down. She does a T12 to pelvis, continues on her um, 
PTH agonist, eight months out, pre-op, post-op, balanced, asymptomatic, and her lumbar pain is gone. And that's one year follow-up. She's a little two years now and actually is my neighbor. So I know she does extremely, extremely well. So this is another thought to think about. You don't need to treat the thoracic curve, treat the symptomatic lumbar curve. And this is truly MIS today with no osteotomies. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, you, you're always a great speaker. And you know, Dr. Hines also gave a great presentation about uh, Olaf highlighting all the positives. You know, um, so, you know, I, I know you're an expert in this, but, you know, for the average person doing an Olaf, uh, you know, what do you think is, is the biggest roadblock? Uh, you know, I, I, I've, uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, if, if you violate the plate, it's the worst thing in the world. I mean, you get none of the benefits from, from this procedure. And I, I mean, what, what are your kind of pearls and tips to avoid doing that? Is it a lot of fluoroscopic usage? Is, is it just positioning retractor correctly? Just, or just tilting tables? So or, you know, I, you're, you're going in an oblique approach. So you, you can um, get misled a little. You know, you can be too posterior. I've seen that where the cage actually enters the neural foramen or, or the canal. I mean, what are your tips and tricks for, to avoid all no, that? Uh, fantastic, Paul. Every, everything's a good question. I completely agree. One is anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. They have to study the MRI. To make your decision, you're gonna go lateral to the aorta or in the bifurcation. That's really important. That's one. Two, you have to see a plane in front of the psoas and identify that plane. What I'm seeing is a lot of people just sweep in front, say they are in front and put the, put the probe right in. They actually don't even see where their probe is going and then go to X-ray because they're stuck on the trans psoas approach. That's a disaster. You're gonna get the sympathetic chain of the ureter there. Three, yes, x-rays. Without a question, get x-rays initially to orient yourself that you're right. The initial tendency is to go for the posterior. I've seen people move the psoas anterior. They've gone so far back, they're sweeping the psoas anterior and they land in the back. So there's a feel to the psoas. You go in there and you feel the psoas and you glide off it as you push the peritoneum. So yes, x-rays. In fact, well, that's one of the reasons I haven't gone to navigation with lateral. I saw your demonstration, uh, fantastic. I really worry, and the two times I did, I could not control the end plate to my satisfaction to get that indirect decompression and to get that. And then you go scoliosis like this. Everything's a nightmare. The angles matter to, to degrees. And you're just easy to take that end plate out. So I think a simple case, yes, but otherwise x-rays, done absolutely orthogonal to see the end plate. Once you got that, then make sure you preserve it. I don't use rotating curettes, no rotary shavers. They're all rasps and tools that scrape the end plate. Make a big point about it. I don't use curettes, no rotary shavers, and preserve that end plate. It just changes all day. Anytime I've lost the end plate, it's a nightmare. So if you don't use curettes, uh, what do you use for the end plate? The rasps. Again? They're yeah. all rasps. And then we have this combo tool that's really sharp on one end and a rasp on the other end. I call it a scraper. It just scrapes the cartilage up and down out. Yeah, I like that instrument. Too. I use that a lot. That's yeah. my favorite. And what, what do you um, use as a biologic for laterals? Uh, it's always been the same. Uh, the, the, the RHBMP2, I, can, I mean, three milligrams per disc space and graft on body. It's been the same for me for years. Uh, it's never changed. Published a lot on it, so... I don't want to change. It works. <laughs> if it works, I, I wouldn't change it. I'm changing. Um, so, well, I, thank you, Neil. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Anytime. Thank you guys for having me. Cheers. Have a good day. Enjoy your hockey. <laughs> I know. Next game. Bye. <laughs>